Hello everyone and welcome to session three of the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. My name is Randy Henderson and I am one of the Black Feminist Reading Circle members of this online group. This session runs from January 20th until June 2nd and includes two week long breaks. Our democratically selected reading material is Harriet A. Washington's book, Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present. Our book group meets each Tuesday evening from 6.30 to 8 on the Google Plus Hangouts on Air platform. You may find the, Glo the Global Black Feminist Reader Circle on Google Plus, YouTube, and Facebook. And always feel free to join us in reading our story together. Welcome everyone to the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. Uh, we are here on Google Plus each Tuesday evening, uh, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we are currently in session three, reading our third book, Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present. And... You can learn more about us uh, at our community page on Google Plus or our archived videos on YouTube or on our Facebook page. This session is running through June 16th, 2015, which means we are coming on down the road. And tonight, we are going to be reading Chapter 13, Infection and Inequity, Illness as a Crime. My name is Michelle Odom. I'm one of the co-hosts of the Reading Circle, along with Randy Danielle Henderson, uh, and I'm located in Brooklyn, New York. Hello, my name is Randy, and I am watching from Atlanta, and I'm, again, happy to see everybody tonight. My name is Anita Walker, and I'm joining you from Connecticut. Welcome to the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. Hey, everyone. Adio. <laughs> I'm Georgette Moses, uh, participating from wow. Columbia, South Carolina. And I'm glad my power came back on. Oh. So I can join you all. <laughs> yes. Hi, everyone. Hope you're feeling well. Um, I'm um, calling you from Utah. Oh, I'm, I'm Kim Brandon, and I'm in New York also. I'm uh, Joel Jones um, from uh, Charleston, South Carolina. How's everybody doing? We're good. Uh, good. Summary. In Chapter 13, author Harriet A. Washington offers an overview of public health responses to two major contagions, tuberculosis and HIV AIDS. She highlights the ways in which these responses, responses have played out very differently for African Americans and our children than for whites, including use of containment therapy or hospital imprisonment to force victims to adhere to a particular schedule of medication the use of black babies and children as research subjects to discover vaccines and cures when they have been orphaned or come under control of the state, and lack of interest in drugs that appear to primarily hold promise for blacks. She includes examples to illustrate how biased research, inequitable and inhumane policies and dangerous abusive powers have shaped the uncomfortably close relationship between African Americans and infectious disease. Unhealthy places and what's that? Decadent. Decadent times infect us by their contagion. AIDS vaccine and the global struggle, is that it? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, finally, 
the world is watching our decision on AIDS vaccination. The World Health Organization mounted a three by five incentive to treat three million people with AIDS by five thousand by 2005, and an effective vaccine would be an essential tool in global struggle with AIDS. Yeah, I bet. But we have an ugly history to overcome. The United States consistently tested candidate. Uh, candidate medications tailored exclusively to the needs of the developed world by using the bodies of the poor uh, third world uh, uh, citizens who are desperate for any type of medical attention. We have a more obligation and, uh, and a redeeming more opportunity to ensure that vac vaccines, that the vaccines we design and adopt as vaccines that work for most endangered populations, enabling the production of such vaccines for the medically underserved at home is a good place to start. It sounds like Harry Washington is suggesting that America should focus on research and cures to assist in the global struggle against AIDS because it is the right thing to do morally and ethically. Given the harm caused to date around the world, is it reasonable, in your opinion, to expect that those who have caused uh, have caused a harm will also want to redeem themselves with any acts of charity? Well, let me tell you something. Condoms filled with AIDS and vaccines that kill people is not out of these people agenda. And I, that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> so, you know, I think this book has demonstrated has demonstrated that uh, a lot of the stuff that's going on around here, uh, you know, we like this. I think we look at uh, experimentation has it stopped. And on the continent, I mean, since it's been brought to light so many times, these people are using the same playbooks. They just, you know, playing a different game. You know, this is what they've always done. Of course, if you introduce a problem, you can you can possibly, you know, solve the problem. So I don't know how many people on the continent of Africa around the world is even willing to trust, especially these people, the World Health Organization for any damn thing. But just how I feel about it. This question is, um, I don't know if y'all ever, it's an old movie. Have you ever heard of Repo Man? Yeah. Yes. Oh, have, yeah. Have oh, y'all yeah. seen it? That movie is the most disturbing thing I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> I'm young, you know, but I was disturbed and I don't, and I haven't watched it. I can't, that, that's one of those movies I, you can only watch like once every 10 years. But, um, this question is making me think of that because, um, in the movie, for those who haven't seen it, you know, you, like, you get, organs and you get all these body parts and stuff and if you can't pay up, you know, if you can't pay for it, they go, they come in and take it back. Ooh. This being like a kidney, a heart, a lung. So ultimately you die, uh, you know, obviously. Um, and most, and the only way to afford these organs and this, you know, these skin and these, um, this help is to be a repo man. You have to get it to the business of the people who go and get these organs from the people who can't pay for it. And um, that's the that's the only way. That's the only job that you could ever have that could actually allow you to pay for for the for the the, the organs. And so this question, um, this last question is: um, Is it reasonable in your opinion to expect that those who have caused harm will also want to redeem themselves? I just I don't think so. Um, you know, obviously the plot would have been much more boring if these people who go back and take these organs would give people more time or, or give them a reasonable payment, you know, option. But I think that sickness and death and disease um, makes too much money. I'm pretty sure if they ever found the cure for breast cancer, we would never find out about it. Um, 
or anything for that matter that's killing killing us, um, especially the poor and especially black people and people of color. I think that people who um, institutionally who who make all this money through these you know these walks and these foundations and not really curing people are, are thinking very temporarily and you know, I don't know how many people um, in the book group are, are religious or spiritual but they're thinking very temporarily not they're not thinking very long term in terms of what they're gonna have to answer to and so I don't I don't foresee um, a real attitude shift until until that moment and obviously we're, we won't be there for those for those moments that they have to have one on with whoever they believe in but I think that as long as people think um, short term think that they'll live forever based off this this money that they can't take with them we it's, it's going to be the same thing over and over again it seems like the co the closer we get to this book on um, the end of the book the more time um the years you know now we're in the the 2000s, it reminds me very much of the beginning of the book and the forced sterilization and the forced experiments. It's the exact same thing and I think that history is just continuing to repeat itself because of the mentality of these white people um, and, and these rich people. So... Yeah. You know, I, agree. Reminds, I'm sorry. I, I agree also, but it reminds me of the Affordable Care Act where it just felt like there were so many, the rich were saying, you're going to take money out of our pockets. This this cannot happen. And it just it was just wild, some of the campaigns that <coughs> ended by, by billionaires. Mm -hmm. It was an opportunity to do something good, but it was fought to the tooth and nail. Right. Well, they just, um, <laughs> speaking of, you know, foundations, uh, it was just reported on the news today that they just took down four cancer scams just today that were collecting tens of millions of dollars. And they were just buying cruises and big boats and houses. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't see any end to this. Yeah, I think the fear is always, you know, uh there's there is there is money in treatment, not in cures, and scarcity of resources, whether it be food, gas, energy, a liver, or something like this here, or keep the, the uh, keep the peasants at bay for a, a, a few crumbs outside the castle of the king. It's basically colonial feudalism. That's all it is. Yeah. Well, I think if there is a solution, it, it's one we're going to have to find for ourselves. Um, I don't know if you guys saw the, the, the article I posted about the, um, the First Nations tribe in Canada, in Canada that um, some oil company was trying to pay the tribe the equivalent of like two hundred and sixty seven thousand dollars per person in order to allow them to I don't know move a pipeline through their their nation um, and they turned it down oh yeah um, and it's, it's yeah. a rare rare scene of conviction um, but I think until we get that kind of conviction for ourselves um, and direct our energy to solving our own problems, um, then there is no then there is no res resolution. When I told you all the Dick or Dicky theory, I left out one important element, which is that sometimes when the Dicky says you know, I'm not having fun. This is not working. Sometimes the dick war responds and says, oh, I didn't know that. What can we do? How can we make you happy? And if you get that kind of response, then you might have some some reason to move forward, some reason you can work with this person. But what I was telling you about was the more typical response, which is, 
like the afford what Kim was saying about the Affordable Care Act. I don't care if you're in pain, you know, I don't care if you're dying, I don't care if you're not happy, I'm having a good time, and that's the only thing that matters. And that's when you know you have to solve your own problems. And so, you know, rarely does the person that is causing the problem for us also want to be the one <laughs> to solve it. It, it. It's just... You just don't see it. You just you just don't see it. When you see problems getting solved, it's because people figure out how to solve them for themselves. So. Mm -hmm.